Thanks for joining us today, guys. Today we are joined by Mark Metry. I'm excited to have him share a little bit about his story, very unique perspective, very successful entrepreneur at a very young age and continues to tap into that as he's building uh, different businesses uh, as he grows his brand. So without further ado, uh, Mark, do you mind introducing yourself to the audience? Yeah, of course, Liam. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, honestly, like there's, uh, you know, there, in terms of introducing myself, like there's so many different, uh, you know, like outside titles that you can call someone, you know, like TEDx speaker, Forbes feature, this and all these different things. For me, I think the best way over the years I've learned to describe myself is that, uh, you know, I spent like literally every single day of my entire life. Um, up until I really decided to get proactive and, and transform my life. I spent every single day trying to hide from the world. I spent every single day trying to like stay as small as possible and, you know, not trying to share my story. I had no idea I even had a story. And today, like being a podcaster, author, speaker, leader, you know, that's a huge part of my life. Like now, literally almost every day, <laughs> I share my story, share my voice some way, somehow. And so for me, I just look at life like that in terms of like, you know, even if you're a certain kind of person, um, you know, you could do anything you want to. And I think there's a lot of people today that, you know, are realizing that they can have things differently, that maybe a lot of things that they used to believe, they don't necessarily believe anymore. And so, um, I'm just like a representation of that. And I try to bring that in everything that I do, whether it's, um, you know, different businesses, like as an advisor to different startups, I sit on the board of like different nonprofits, all kinds of different things that I do. I always try to bring that essence in there because I think that's the most important thing. And like, I've been in an area in my life where, you know, like, I had a decently successful like passive income business that was making me six figures, nothing crazy. Um, and I was like 16, 17, 18. And I still remember, you know, being so like depressed and being so socially anxious and never being able to use my voice to never feel like I can be myself, which eventually led me to, you know, develop all kinds of different like unhealthy habits led me to, you know, even be suicidal at one point in my life. And that's why anything I do, I also try to champion mental health and, um, and, you know, truly being able to live your own life. I think that's so important. So thank you for having me on your show. <laughs> I know I just went on for a little a tangent, but it's all right. We're excited to have you. Um, can you tap into, you, you talked about all of these different, we'll call them labels, right? That, uh, society places on you based on your achievements or things that are deemed achievements by society, let's say. So as you look introspective, right? And as you've gone through your journey, which I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit, what's the one thing that you would call yourself, right? Like, how would you describe yourself uh, in kind of, uh, enlightened is probably not the right word, right? But in the, uh, as you've progressed in uh, self-confidence, right, uh, to where you are today, you know, how do you describe you? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think I'm enlightened. I don't think that's, uh, that's ever like a finite, uh, you know, thing. It's always changing. Um, I think, honestly, the best way to describe myself, and I think this is going to sound pretty weird to some people, uh, or some people might think I'm like pretentious, but I think for me, the number one thing I've used to describe myself is like, I just feel like I'm a, I'm like a spiritual warrior. And like, the reason why I say that is because, you know, there's all different kinds of tools in life, right? Whether it's money, finance, business, uh, careers, leadership, uh, there's all these different tools, but ultimately, you know, I think life is about using those tools to, do what you want and also, you know, to help the world as much as possible. And so for me, I'm super blessed to have a life where, you know, I'm like a first, uh, I'm a son of first generation immigrants. Um, I was born here in America and, you know, I, you know, I was dealt a certain hand of, you know, like my parents are poor, um, having not so good health, never doing really well in school, having learning issues. And 
I've just like tried to make the best out of that to like almost killing myself and being obese and being depressed to like now, for example, like I'll, I'll like be out, uh, you know, like with my parents to like some park or like I'll be at the mall or something. And because of like my notoriety through my podcast and through LinkedIn, sometimes I'll have like these crazy like scenarios with people in public where it's like, holy crap. And like, I'll just be walking through a mall. And I remember specifically like, uh, like I think it was right before COVID I was walking through the mall with my parents, which is something that I don't really do that often. And it was like the same mall that like I sort of spent my, my days at when I was a kid, just like running around, just like doing nothing. And I remember just going like randomly going for a, for a walk with my parents and like all of a sudden this guy walking out to me and him basically saying like, he said something like, you know, Hey Mark, like, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if you ever saw like a LinkedIn message from me or something, but he was like, you know, two years ago, I didn't have a job and I started to follow you through your LinkedIn. And then I've listened to your podcast and then I just like became a, a better person and now I'm able to have like a career that I want and I'm able to do this, this, and that. And like that happens, you know, every once in a while. And it's always a reminder of like, you know, my work here is deeper and, um, and yeah. And I think again, like out of everything that I do, I feel like I do so many different things that, and as I've, you know, continued to grow on my journey and as I've continued to, just grow and learn as a person. A lot of the times you you begin to realize that, of course, learning is very important. Like I always try to learn every day, but also a big part of the process is realizing that uh, you have to unlearn a lot of different things, uh, especially early on. And I feel like for me, um, you know, I just do that so often uh, that, uh, that I've really realized that like there's a lot of people out there that... Uh, you know, need help, whether it's in terms of, uh, you know, kind of like what I went through and how to get out of that. And so, um, and the more and more I sort of grow on this journey and the more I unlearn things, the more I also realize that the way that I think of myself and like the way that I think of my identity has been very much on like a fixed point. And, And the more that I grow and the more that I become free, the more that I realize I can do things more than I had any idea. And those may be in different categories of life. Um, you know, like for example, like I used to like, this is just a random example. Like I, when I was a little kid, I used to be obsessed with uh, like fish. I remember I'd go to the library and I would just like read books about fish. And like, if I go to a pet store, if I go through the ocean, I can like literally just have like, I just have like memory from way back then. I can just like literally name exactly what kind of fish that is. And like, for example, I haven't gone fishing in a long time, but for example, today I went fishing and I never would think of myself as someone who would go fishing or someone who, um, you know, is like a fisher and like, uh, you know, like a, like a few, a few weeks before I went fishing in the ocean, I caught like 10 fish. It was crazy. So, you know, that's like a small example of, I think the more and more you learn, the more and more you unlearn, the more you realize that it's not necessarily about sticking to one kind of a label. It's about sort of unlearning a lot of labels and then just living your life and then just seeing kind of what happens alongside like your goals and what you want to do in the world and for other people. <laughs> a lot there to unpack. Um, let's, uh, I've got a couple other questions there. Let's revisit that. Uh, I want to go back real quick. Uh, you had talked about making a six figure income as a mm. year old. Like what inspired you to, you know, have that entrepreneurial spirit? What were you doing? And, um, you know, how did you achieve that success? Yeah. So I remember, you know, when, uh, when my family and I, when we were like, you know, growing up when my parents first came to America, like growing up in the project and (laughs) never really having any money. I remember I would go to like the neighboring towns that I had, that had a lot of money And I remember just like, I don't know what I was doing. I think I would go to the newspaper and like try to create like vintage baseball cards through like cutting pieces of like the baseball players in the newspaper and then gluing them to like a thick, you know, slice and then selling them as like vintage baseball cards, like handcrafted. Um, 
And so I'm pretty sure I did that because I had no money. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's because like I wanted to get cookies at the cafeteria and I asked my mom and she's like, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't afford that. Uh, so I was like, I want some cookies. So, but then later in my life, um, eventually as I moved away from that, like probably around, you know, like, I don't know, fifth grade, sixth grade. Uh, I think one of the biggest forces for me to like become an entrepreneur was really just social anxiety. Like I just like had very few friends where I could just be myself, but I also had like this yearn to connect with people and to be social. And so also at that time, social media was first sort of becoming a thing and the internet was blossoming and all these different communities and all this stuff that the internet has grown to. And I just got on that. I remember like having a Twitter, having like a YouTube channel in 2008 uh, I played a lot of video games. It was mostly centered around that. Um, and like, for example, I remember having a YouTube channel in I think 2009 that had like 35,000 subscribers back before, like there were people on YouTube with like, everyone just has a million subscribers. Um, it was way before that. And I remember just being in that world just exposed me to so much. And I honestly started so many different online businesses that I've lost count of how many I've started the vast majority of them have failed, but I did have like, you know, a, you know, a handful of different things that, you know, started to like generate income. And I honestly, I don't remember a lot of it. I don't remember um, like putting in necessarily a lot of hard work. It was really just like, I was stressed. I had no money and I had social anxiety and I just like fueled all of that into just like hustling and doing whatever I needed to do on my, my computer, on my phone for hours, like all day, every day. And so that was really, I would say like the biggest influence by far as to why, you know, I was led down that path. And then also because like, because of social anxiety, I didn't play any sports. I wasn't a part of any clubs, anything like that as a kid. Um, I also got bad grades. And so I also was like, Oh crap, I'm, I'm screwed. Like I'm, I'm, I'm unsuccessful. I'm either going to go work at McDonald's or like, I don't really have another choice. So it was one of those things too, where I was like, Oh, I, I like literally have to do this. Um, so it was sort of like randomly, I didn't really know what I was doing in the moment. Um, but I'm super grateful because all those skills, I still have those today. And that's taught me an invaluable, you know, skill set and just like understanding for how like at, sort of outside success can occur and what you have to do. So it's definitely been interesting. <laughs> well, let, you talked a bit about growing up in the projects. You talked about your parents being poor, right? Like, so there was this necessity uh, to find ways to make money, to be successful, to, you know, do the things that you wanted. What, what was your mindset or how did you make decisions when you went from, you know, uh, hustling vintage baseball cards to having a six-figure income, uh, you've got all this money now, right? Like, what did you do? Yeah. What was your thought process, right? Did you uh, go make more companies to make more money? Did you go buy a lot of cookies? Cause that was a cool thing to do, right? Like what, uh, what fueled your strategy in terms of kind of where you spent that money? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think the shift that I had from selling baseball cards to starting a six figure income, I didn't know it at the time, but really one of the biggest things that I learned is that like, I, I can't be the one who is out there selling the individual newspapers. I have to be the person who gives other people the education, the money for them to go do it. And so for me, like, I think in a lot of my successful businesses, there was always some sort of like a community social aspect where other people could do the work for me. And like, for example, there's a, you know, like there's uh there's this, there's this guy, Seth Godin, I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, and I, I interviewed him on my podcast way back in the day. Um, and he has this quote, he says like, the best kind of marketing is the marketing you don't have to do. It's the one where other people are doing it for you, whether that's they work for you and you're paying them or they have some sort of incentive or there's some social piece in the community and people love what you're doing so much that they want to tell their friends and everything about it. There was always that piece. And I think that piece has definitely been the thing that 
you know, made it go from, you know, not that much money to more money. So, and then in terms of how I spent it, so, oh man, I honestly have so many regrets, but, um, you know, I think the biggest thing that was probably the best thing that I did was I was definitely able to change me and my entire family's life for sure. Like change our entire socioeconomic status. Um, so that was great. And then number two, man, is like, I, I had no idea what I was doing. My parents had never had money. No one was teaching me any of this. Um, so for me, honestly, what I did was aside from just changing me and my family's life, um, I remember just like donating a lot of it to charity. I remember like one summer we like collaborated with this charity and we like gave away like literally all of our money. I went, we had a staff team of like uh, 10 people and then 20 other people. Um, so, and then the rest, I'm sure I bought cookies. <laughs> so it was definitely, it was definitely good from the sense of like, it showed me what was possible in life. It was great for my family. It was great for like some of those charities. And then it was great for her to show me like opportunity and like what else I could do in life. And then I think also too, what's important for me to like, what I realized is that, um, you know, there's like the whole Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm sure you've heard of it where, the bottom layer is like the most important. And it basically means like humans need these things. And if they don't, then th they're just not going to, you know, work successfully. And so I, in the bottom layer, it was like, you need to have enough food and, and shelter and water and things like that. And then you have to have like security, some sense of safety, and then you can have some sense of like emotional or personal safety and like relationships. And then you can have like your sense of self-esteem and like have truly be confident in all these different things. And I think one of the biggest things about making money and shifting my life was moving up those needs. Because what I learned is that like, I could never think about my mental health because I was always so, because I was poor, I was always worried about like, Oh, like what, you know, I can't do these things. What am you know, how, what am I going to do? But then the more money I've gotten, I think it, it like frees up your mind to different things. And I think that also led me to be able to like change my life. Um, you know, because for me, like even when I was depressed and suicidal, it's not like I was broke. I still had money, you know, but there's a lot of people who are also in that same scenario, but they're, but they are broke. And they also have like that added financial stress, which, uh, which if you're, especially if you're in that state, you, like you're going to be frozen in anxiety. You're not going to be able to take the right steps. Um, so I think making the money and was very good for that reason that it helped me get through there. Um, and so, yeah, and I honestly, I didn't really invest it. Like I wish I invested, I started investing later on. I, man, I wish I put in all my money <laughs> in different investments. Like I, I wish, um, but, uh, so yeah, investing for me has, you know, I wish I started earlier for sure. So as you've gotten to a point where now it sounds like you're definitely investing, do you have a, a structure in terms of how you determine, you know, where that extra income goes, right? I'm sure obviously, you know, the socio socioeconomics of the family is really important. I'm sure you're at a level where that's now stabilized, right? And so now as you've got like, hey, do I put X percent, right, to charity, right, uh, to tithe, to, you know, fun toys, to investment, right? Like, how do you think about, you know, where that money goes for you now? And how is that different from uh, previously? Yeah, that's huge. Um, you know, for me, I, I just like, I always just, um, like, I, I do have a system. I, I don't know exactly, but I, I think it's like 10% out of like any kind of monthly income, that I make automatically goes towards investments. Um, and then I also am an investor for just like different, um, like startups and different things where different people have invited me, different co-founders. Um, so that's what I do. Then I also, you know, I don't know how much you're into this. I'm not really into it, but um, in 2015, um, one of the investments that I did make was I bought a ton of Bitcoin and Ethereum back in 2015 when I think Bitcoin was like $250. Ethereum was like $5, 10, I don't even remember. So I, I, I honestly don't know that much about it other than like a conceptual, like the power of blockchain. So I definitely have that. I haven't learned too much though about crypto. I I'm not like one of these people who's like doing all these different new, new things. I, I'm, not, I'm not that person, but 
um, that's sort of where, where it's kind of how it's sort of been for me. Did you uh, sell it off or did you hold it? No, I still have it. I'm just holding right now. I haven't sold anything. I haven't touched it. Look at that. That's a nice little return. Just sitting there for a future date. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Like I, you know, I'm sure I've definitely invested in things that haven't worked, but I remember having like the craziest conversations with my friends in 2013, 2014, 2015 about Bitcoin. And, and, and like, again, like, I, I don't know, like, I'm not an expert about it. I'm not going to like say it's the best or I have no idea, but I remember just having these conversations on me telling them like, you know, blockchain is going to change the world, all the, the currency structure of these governments and all these different things. And, um, and I just like, remember buying it and not really thinking about it, but just having it just like in case. Um, and I honestly never even thought that it would reach this. I thought that, I thought that it would be used to like, to like, like use it as like an arcade or like, something. I would have no understanding of it whatsoever. Um, but now I'm trying to learn about it. So it's definitely one of those things where I'm like, wow, I'm really glad I randomly did that. <laughs> Yeah, so to put it in perspective, one Bitcoin today is 40,766. Oh my God. I'm, that's crazy. Isn't that crazy. Um, yeah, a tremendous evolution uh, in terms of the cryptocurrencies. But, uh, you know, congratulations, right? Like, great that you were able to take advantage of that trend. Uh, so that's awesome. Um, yeah. You talked a lot about social anxiety, right? And you were. Yeah. Able- yourself into the entrepreneurship, which uh, I don't know if this is a correct categorization, but it gave you a way out, right? And you also talked about people who are kind of still there and frozen. Um, do you view entrepreneurship as a way, as a avenue or as a method that someone who's struggling with social anxiety could get out, right? And is that something that could be I'm going very theoretical a lot more than I yeah. used to, right? But is that a is that a viable plan that, you know, if a charity or something, a foundation put that in place, would you know be able to exponentially help these people who are in that situation? Or, you know, are there other ways that you think might be, you know, more helpful? Yeah, I mean, so I remember again, like I remember being, you know, 18 and you know, like making six figures, but still having a lot of social anxiety. And I think for me, like one of the biggest things was um I definitely think entrepreneurship was the way that I made it out when it comes to like financially, like literally, like where I like my socioeconomic status. Um, but I think for me, part of also like my continued success has also been like a a believer of a believer in like a practitioner. And I believe that like, you know, if you have social anxiety, you need to deal with that in real life before you like, you know, what people ask me all the time, like, how do you record a podcast? How do you do that? I think that you really have to like get to the root cause and deal with it in your own life when it comes to like your mind, your brain, your psychology, your physiology, all these things first, um, or at least in tandem. Uh, And then for, and then once you do that, I think things get a lot easier and by easier, I don't mean like the work, but I mean, just like how you, just like your default mental state for how you approach life. Like I remember before when I had no idea what mental health was before I had no idea what social anxiety was, but I was just like trying to live every day. It was so brutal. It's like, you literally have to like fight and claw your way like mentally, psychologically. And uh, the reality is, is like, if you have anxiety, depression, things like that, that's not good for your brain. Like having anxiety, depression, um, although it leads to like drug use and things like that, um, it's like similar to doing drugs, especially like if you face it for over five, 10 years and you don't really come up with the right coping strategies and ways to deal with it at like a true like root cause layer, because I honestly think anything other than that is just a band-aid. And I think band-aids, you know, you, you do something, you might feel good for like a day or a few hours, but then the next day you're just back in the same scenario. And so that's why I believe like you really in your life, if you have social anxiety, you really have to like get to the root cause, no matter how much money you make, of course, that may, you know, impact 
you know, what you're able to access and so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, if you have social anxiety, like you need to deal with it uh, at a true deep layer, address your health, physical health, mental health, uh, you know, all things that, um, you know, are talked about. And there's so many different ways to go down it. And it depends on the person. But I definitely believe that you have to like go with the science. You have to, you know, talk to someone who knows what they're talking about and deal with it with a true root cause. Because if you're able to really like manage your mental health and get proactive about it, mentally speaking, it gets a lot better and you're able to do a lot more without as much like mental effort. And I think that's huge as someone who bleeded and scratched and clawed their way out like it definitely leaves scars, you know? So, and I'm still young. So keep that in mind for you, if you're older, um, you know, so that's where I think it's one of those things where like, you have to be proactive about it. Uh, because I honestly think like, you know, depending on the individual, you know, some people like me who, you know, as kids, they were always very shy. They always had health problems. Uh, you know, you're going to have social anxiety for, the rest of your life, if you don't do something about it, if you're not proactive about it. Whereas I think other people who maybe are more just like introverts, they're more quiet. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, maybe they're shy, but not really. Um, whereas I think like, then there's a different skill set. So uh, it's, it's definitely very interesting. I don't know if any of that made sense or not, but. <laughs> so uh, as we wrap up two kind of quick hit questions for you, one, if someone was to ask you, you know, hey, what should I invest in today? What would your go-to be for them? What I would say is like, I have never, ever, 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 ever in my entire life seen an investment that has paid off more than investing in my brain. Reality is, is that unless, you know, we got Elon Musk's Neuralink coming out soon and we can, you know, take out our brains and replace them with machines, your brain is the only, is like, it's always going to be with you. It's never going to leave you. If you're making billions of dollars and you're in like the world's fanciest hotel and you're surrounded by the best people in the world and you go to, you know, put your head at night to go to sleep, you still got your same brain. So I think by far like investing in your brain, that's going to give you the highest return on your investment. That investment is never going to be wrong ever. So now I got to ask a follow-up question. What does investing in your brain look like? Uh, is there a certain activity that to you, right? What does that mean to you? That's a great question. So obviously, like there's so much to do with this. And I'm, you know, I'm currently in the middle of uh, uh, getting certified by Harvard in neuroscience, which is cool. So I've learned so much. But I think one of the biggest things that I've seen is like there was a study in the Journal of Neuroscience in 2017 that basically said like there are four main ways to uh, you know, change the state of your brain, improve your brain without drugs. And basically what those are is number one, it's, and this is not ranked based on order of importance, but number one, it's going outside and going in the sunlight, making sure that you get enough vitamin D. There's so many different people, depending on you, where you live, we're all stuck inside. We're all hustling, you know, in, you know, inside all day, looking at our phones, going outside in the sun is super important. Number two, your diet. Your diet is super, super important. I don't, I don't necessarily believe in a universal, uh, you know, healthy diet that works for everybody. But I do think that trying to eat like a natural whole foods diet as much as possible is very important. And especially making sure that, you know, like your brain is made out of uh, amino fatty acids. And the reality is, is you get those from food. And there's all different kinds of health implications that I can reference that happen when you don't eat the right foods. Like, for example, the Department of Justice did a study with, with veterans who had committed suicide. And basically what they showed is that in the group who committed suicide, if you looked at their brains, if you scan their brains, they have like something like a 65, 75% um, deficiency and omega-3 essential fatty acids, which you primarily find um, in like a lot of different kinds of healthy fats, like nuts and fish and eggs and different products like that, which a lot of people, like if you're just eating the American standard diet, you're not really getting that. Um, 
So that's one. And then also trying to, of course, like minimize foods that are not good for you. Um, sugar, uh, junk food, any kind of processed food, really. Uh, and then number three, exercising, moving. And then number four, trying to engage in some sort of a practice, whether that's um, like therapy or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or psychotherapy or mindfulness meditation um, or, or having some sort of a practice to calm down your mind uh, at a consistent level or to, t- or to give you more awareness of your mind. Those four things are what I would say are like, that for sure works like hundred percent, you know, the, that stuff isn't a fad or, you know, it's not going to be changed by the science or anything. Those four things for sure work. So I think those are the, what I would say. Awesome. Um, a lot of our listeners, right. Might be going through uh, social anxiety or might have kids who might be going through that stuff, right. If yeah. they want to reach out and connect, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah. So that's a great question. And, and yeah, I highly recommend anyone to reach out to me. I always try to respond back to people. The best way is if you just go to my website, M-A-R-K-M-E-T-R-Y.com, just my first and last name, there will be a contact form. There's all there. Like I also have my email newsletter. You can put your email in there. I send out educational articles, uh, things like that all every week. So that's the best place where people can check out my stuff and please reach out. Awesome. Appreciate the time today, Mark. Uh, Thanks for joining and sharing some insights, a variety of topics and kind of knowledge bombs that you dropped and much appreciated. Of course, I bet I was different from your other guests. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mark.